So that's not really all that important because it's not, it's not that important because I am just, just everybody here. And what I'm going to talk about tonight is something different, more intimate, something I haven't been talking about that much. The uh, Hong Kong skeptics asked me if I would talk about uh, my journey through cancer treatment. And that's kind of, that's why it's not important that it's really who I am so much. I'm just going to talk about that generally and how, um, I, how I was treated and that kind of thing. And, um, you know, the, I was, I'm from California. I've been in the area about a month. I came out to do a lecture in Brisbane, uh, Australia on skepticism. I'm very prominent, well not very, but I'm prominent in the skeptic community for a lot of the activism I do and the Wikipedia work I do. But this was something a little bit different. So this is me a few years ago. Um, I didn't know I had cancer. I had breast cancer, but I didn't know I had a lump in my breast at this time. And I was just living my life like normal. I was just a regular, normal person. Um, I had, um, you can see, I had this thing for hats. I didn't bring any hats with me tonight, but um, long black hair, it's all dyed. Rode a motorcycle for a while. I was uh, really into that kind of world, and um, there I am waving on the motorcycle. So I was um, just living my life in California, having a pretty good time. There I am, I, I put that picture in there. I was 47 when I took that picture. It was my son's 21st birthday, so I, had to, I took a picture, and I, I just love it. It's a little blurry, that's why I look so good. But. <laughs> But that was, that was me, and I decided I'd better, you know, I broke up with that boyfriend. I decided I think I should sell my motorcycle because I was getting close to 50. I wasn't really riding it all that much, and it was so dangerous. I mean, in California, there's big, wide spaces to ride in. There's people who are riding around, they're crashing, you know, and scaring you and all that kind of stuff. It's pretty dangerous riding a motorcycle, not just because of me, but the people around you, you know, who aren't making very good decisions and don't see you. So I decided I probably should sell my motorcycle. You know, that's risky. So I have a boyfriend, you know, and I have a good life. Uh, I turned 50. I have, um, this is me at work. This is what I do. I'm a portrait photographer. I specialize in infants and children under five. And I've been doing that for 33 years. Then um, <laughs> I have cats. This is my son, Sterling. And uh, this one's missing me so much right now. I've been away, like I said, a month. But so, I, you know, I'm just an average person, just, just a regular person. And I don't know, do you guys remember Angelina Jolie? And that, that happened a few years ago? Gosh, it's been a couple years ago. So that was a big news all over the place, I guess. And so Angelina Jolie had had um, her sister and her mother had died from breast cancer or, or some kind of cancer, I can't even remember at the moment. But she went in to find out if she carried a gene that would show that she would probably also get the, the cancer herself. And she indeed carried the cancer. And so without having cancer, she went in and had her breasts removed and her, her uterus removed so she would have a much better chance of surviving to see her children grow up. So that story was you know, really prominent in everywhere, as I said, and my friend, at work, and I were talking about it, and I said, when's the last time you had a mammogram? And she says, gosh, it's been a few years, I think. And I said, you know, I think it's been a few years for me, too. It was 50, 50, I think, yeah. So I said, I, I should go. I said, pick up the phone, you call, and I'll call, and we'll make appointments. And I absolutely, positively did not think I was going to have cancer. That was just like the most ridiculous thing in the world that I would have cancer. I have none of the bad habits. It doesn't, it's not my family. I don't smoke. I eat okay. I exercise. I, um, I don't really drink. I don't do drugs. You know, I mean, I don't, I'm not around radiation factory or something like that. I'm not, I, you know, I don't work in nuclear, whatever, and chemicals and stuff like that. So I thought, well, that's the most ridiculous thing in the world, that I would have something like cancer. Well, turns out I did have cancer. But it was stage two, and stage two if you, is relatively easy to treat if you go and you get your, if you do what the doctor recommends you to do. So what I'm gonna talk about is a little bit of my, uh, what happened, and there's uh, maybe some slides in here that are kind of medically, I hope you guys don't get all grossed out and everything, but I left the ones out of here that are really, really bad. So, when the doctor tells me 
the woman came in and she was the head of the mammography center and she sits me down and she's, you know, I knew something was wrong because they call you up and say, come back in. We have a, a question about something we saw on your, on your uh, scan. And it was like an hour, I'd just gotten home. So I come back in and they sit me down and they said, well, we think that there's something there and it looks like it's cancer. And the woman who told me was so pregnant that she was having her baby the next day. She was gonna have a, uh, a C-section. And she sat me down and told me this. And I, you know, of course I cried a little bit. I said, oh my gosh, you know, I can't believe I have cancer for real. She goes, well, we're not exactly sure we're kind and all that. So we won't know for, for a week. But uh, yeah, it looks like it. And I felt so bad for her because she was going to have a baby the next day. And she had to tell me this. It was, it really felt awful. It really felt awful. So it made me kind of wake up and go, okay, you know, this woman, yeah, we'll, we'll be okay. So really the way they do it in California is they hand you the paperwork and they say, here's your doctor, here's your oncologist, here's your radiologist, here's your, um, your surgeon, your schedule for surgery on, uh, for your biopsy on this day. And you really don't have to think about it. They don't give you a lot of, uh, you know, where you have to go try to find a hospital and try to find a doctor and try to find, all, they take all the decision making away from you. But, I'm really into the skepticism stuff. I really, really believe in science, and I really follow the scientific method. But in the back of your mind, you're thinking, gee, do I really have to go through chemo? Do I really have to go through all that? God, that's awful. It's just, you know, you, you hear the C word, and you're like, oh my gosh, I'm gonna have to go through this? It's, it's awful, the thought. So when people present you with some kind of alternative, it sounds so easy, you're not gonna have to get chemo, you're gonna have, you know, take this pill. You know, it's homeopathy. It's okay. You'll be fine. Don't worry about that. That's for big pharma and the doctors. They're just hiding the medicine from you and all that. That's how you feel. You, you sort of think to yourself, well, maybe there is an easier route. Well, I kind of thought about that for a couple minutes and I said, well, I'm too public. I'm too out there. If I was to try something alternative, I mean, I just couldn't look people in the faces again. I, I just can't be doing that kind of stuff. So I kept with the route that my doctor said that it's t totally tested, blinded, replicated. Um, they haven't done a lot of new discoveries in breast cancer in the last 10-ish years. It's pretty much the standard of care is the same standard of care that you would have gotten 10 years or more. What's changed is the treatment the way you go and you get things done, the way they handle you, the way um, uh, the whole process is, that's different. And they've really made great strides because they, of other people who've had cancer and what worked for them and what didn't work for them. So um, I, I remember going to work one day and I told a customer of mine that I had cancer. And she's like, it was like the first person I told it wasn't a family member or a friend. And she was like, Oh, and she starts laying in on me about some kind of treatment that this guy she knows is doing. She says, you go down to the vet, to the vet store, the pet store, and you get this horse pill that they give to horses. And you take that, she says, my, this guy she knows has been doing that, and he's cancer, it just, it cleared up his cancer. I'm like, really? She says, oh yeah, he swears by it. She says, it happened like a couple years ago. And she says, now, it's the most amazing thing. Now, this time, now that he has cancer again, she says, he's going to do it again. And I said, well, what? He has cancer again? She says, yeah. So he's going to try the same treatment because it, it worked for him so well before. And I thought, well, wait a minute. Didn't you just say he had cancer and he's cured? And now he has cancer again? And it's been a very short amount of time. She says, yeah. I said, so he wasn't cured. And you just saw this lady just kind of get this look on her face like, I hadn't thought of that. And I thought, so he's been untreated pretty much for a whole year, or a year and a half. She's just, and he's coming back again. And, and that doesn't sound good. And she says, oh, yeah. But it worked for him. And I'm thinking in my mind, you know, how much longer has this guy got to live? And, and, you know, I just, if it was as simple as going to the vet and getting a pill from a, from a horse doctor, 
we would have cancer cured. People wouldn't be dying from cancer. People wouldn't be going through this. And I hear the argument all the time that it's big pharma, the doctors are hiding the secret from us. But doctors have cancer too. Their loved ones have cancer as well. Why would you hide it? It just doesn't make any sense to me at all, but whatever. They, uh, they, 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 they did that. So here's what I did. I can't remember what slide's next. So um, uh, that's how I dealt with it. So I said to myself, I'm a public person. I have a lot of Facebook friends. I'm out there. I've got to find some way of deciding how I'm going to do this. I'm going to lose my hair. I'm going to lose, you know, I'm, I'm, how am I going to do this? I have to work. Um, I have to do my life. So I said, I'm going to go all out and be as public as possible. Keep in mind, this is my own experience. It may be different from some other people. But this is how I embraced it. So what I did is um, I had long hair. And when I started to feel like my hair was starting to come out a little bit, I went in and had it cut really short. And I got a cut that I thought, I said, I want something I would never get. So you just do whatever you want with my hair. Cut it short. Because I knew it would only last for maybe three more weeks. So I went in, and they say that this is really good for your self-esteem, that you're making the decision to have your hair cut because it's not gonna, it's, you're cutting it off. Darn it, it's gonna fall out, but you know what? I'm gonna make it fall out, because I'm gonna cut it off. So this is me at the salon, and um, I'm, I made the decision that, you know, it's just falling out, and I said, okay, it's gotta go. So here I am, I'm getting my hair cut off, and then this is me getting my hair at the salon, and I had it shaved off while I was there, and I, and there's a video of me on YouTube getting it shaved off, and. I pretty much laughed through it. It felt really good, because I'd never been bald before. I think most women, well, at least I assume, you guys know, most women kind of have this idea, I wonder what I'd look like bald. I don't know, just, you guys ever thought that? You know, I wonder how I'd look if I was bald. What would I, what would I look like? So I thought, okay, I, I can do this. So I went, and this is me right after getting my hair cut, and a haircut, my hair shaved. So, <laughs> Uh, so I was, I was trying to be just really public, and then I went, here's me getting treatment, I'm getting my, my chemo, and I learned a lot. I didn't know anything about cancer, I knew nothing about this kind of stuff. So I went and I, I got dressed up, I put on my jewelry, I did makeup, my, we walked back and forth to the treatment center, which is a few miles. And what they do, I don't know if any of you guys here know, how it's treated, but this little thing right here on my port, because my, because my cancer was right here. They removed the surgery, and they said um, once they showed me where the lump was. Oh my God! For weeks until my surgery, I was sitting there playing with it right here. <laughs> I was like, "Give me a knife. I'll just pup t take that puppy out." You know, you're like playing with it, and it just how could I missed it? But I did. So what they do is they put, and I wish I'd brought my port with me, but what they do is they put under your skin right here, I hope nobody grosses out, but they put this little thing under your skin and it just is right there. And what it does is it has a little tube that goes down into your artery. And then when you go in to get your chemo, and I had 16 treatments, they go in and they, they put this little butterfly, yellow butterfly thing on it that has a little hook that goes like that into the, goes pierces your skin and it goes into the artery, and that's how you get your chemo. So they have to pay, tape it all on you. That's what's that's on there. So it's got IVs hooked up to me, and I'm just sitting there for an hour getting my getting my chemo. So it's kind of a social thing to some extent. You can sit and talk with people if you want. Uh, here's me on another day. Um, my boyfriend or my son would go with me usually and, and sit across from me, and they usually nap. And um, I'd sit and read, because it was one of the few times that I could sit and read and um, you see the drip thing up there, and it's just dripping in there. You don't feel anything. It, it's, you don't notice it at all. It's, it's not even something you notice. You have to, if you go to the bathroom, and you do because you're getting all this water, you have to take the whole machine with you, and you drag it with you, and you can socialize with the people as you go. Here's my boyfriend <laughs> taking a nap. Chairs are quite comfortable. Um, and this is my son. He's brought his computer, and he's hanging out there. I wanted to make sure that I did this the treatment I did was a lot because of my, my son and the people around me. I wanted to show them that, you know, don't be, you, you can, yeah, you're scared, but you should really just, you're going to have to trust 
science, you're gonna have to trust your doctors, you're gonna have to trust that, that this is gonna be something that you can do, do it. So I made my, well I didn't make him, he went with me, but he was 21, 20, I think he's 21, he's 24 now. So um, this is happening in 2013. So he came to most of my visits. He went to my surgeries. I mean, he wasn't there when they were doing the cutting open, but he, you know, he was there. He did. He was with me with um, my doctor visits and things like that. So it was a great learning experience for him. This is just a slide. That little yellow thing right there um, is the thing that they put on you. And uh, I took a lot of photos as I was going along. I'm a photographer. And I took a lot of photos, so I want to remember it. It's the time you're going through it. Oh my gosh, you can't think of anything else at the time. It seems like it's your life evolves around your weekly treatment of chemo. But later, I mean, it's been two years, a little over two years, I am pretty much starting to, it's fading. And then here's a little machine that they put on there. That, 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 that's my skin and they just put it on and they just tape it on and it goes in there and it just pulls in place little butterfly and here on my last day my last chemo I dressed up as most ridiculously as I possibly could um, um, so I had this dress from Halloween I had all this glittery stuff on me and I had these great hats I had some of the most amazing hats people bought me hats I went and bought hats and things that you would never wear now when you're going through chemo it's called chemo chemo I your, your, your eyes get all messed up. You just, at well, least this is what happened to me. You can't, um, you can't, uh, your eyes are just dry. You have to go, I was always wearing contacts and then I had to start wearing glasses. And <laughs> um, this is me getting my last treatment. What I had done, oh, there I am with my machine on my last day. And here's with one of my nurses that you know, you get to know them. They give you these little Hawaiian lays like it's your last day. There's all the IVs. Um, so I'd also had to go through radiation afterwards. I seem, I seem to be missing a slide or so. Let me look. But this is radiation. I, they give you a certificate. Radiation is nothing. I've heard people so many times tell me, gosh, radiation, that's so scary. It's like, no, they, they radiate exactly your, the part of your body. They line you up. I have three tattoos. I don't know if it's considered three tattoos because I got them all at the same time, or if it's one tattoo just very spread out. Because what they do is they put three dots on you. One, two, three. So that when you go in, you're laying on this machine, they line you up exactly where you're supposed to be lined up. The lights come down on you, and they shine on you, and they've got you exactly. So they radiate just a little portion of the breast, just exactly there. You don't feel anything. Um, after a while, you might get a little sunburn after a few treatments, but I think I had 30 treatments. The problem with radiation is, is you're supposed to go almost every day, and you're there for like five minutes of treatment. So it's a pain in the ass to leave work, go over across town, go check in, and then you see the same person every day, the radiologist, and I mean, it's like, what do you say? So how's your day? What do you think the weather? You're trying to come up with something to say because they have to get you all exactly right positioned and all that kind of stuff, but you know, radiation was no big deal at all. Oh, here I am again by getting my last treatment. Now, the, the chemo, I have three different kinds of chemo. I didn't know that. I thought chemo was just chemo. There's lots of different kinds of chemo. So the first chemo I had, I had for 14 treatments, or yeah, 14 treatments. It's called Taxol. It's made from the yew tree. And Taxol, um, I lost my hair everywhere, trust me. Um, eyebrows, eyelashes, that was really weird to be uh, not have the ability to really put any makeup on. I lost my fingernails, my toenails, and they said that it's unusual that you would lose your fingernails. So don't freak out. I mean, it's, they said it was really freaky weird that I lost my fingernails, but that was really the worst part. Of course, you lose your hair. And um, uh, so then she, the last treatment I had was every two weeks, and I only got it three or four times, and they call it the Red Death. That's what I see in the media. I think the red death, this is giving you life. It's, it's going, you know, I don't like that, the way they use that, but that's what they, they call it. But it's very toxic. She can't get it on her hands, um, and it's not through an IV. It's actually, they take it and they put it in an, oh, I have a picture. Oh, this is one of the things I did. So that was on the back of my head while I was getting my treatment because I was going around town. I was like going to this grocery store. I was going in anywhere I could to get people to talk and say, What's, what, what, you know? So I really took advantage of it. 
Um, so I went in and got some hats. So as you can see, I really had a lot of fun with the fashion. I got to dress up. I never dressed up for Halloween before. So I went and bought the craziest things I could find. So I got to be Cleopatra with an actual Cleopatra wig. This is at a skeptic conference in, in Tacoma. So I traveled. I went about my day. Oh, 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 oh. Do you guys know who Nosferatu is? I didn't know who Nosferatu was, but he's one of the first vampires ever in media, in the, in the thing. So somebody on Facebook, because I mean, I'm really public. One of the things about it is, the problem is, is when I decided to be very public is, do I be really ridiculous and say how great my day is and how I'm managing through cancer on, in my public feed? Or do I say how horrible it is or do I have, to, I have to find some middle? Because you remember, you've got an audience of people who are watching you. And if you say, oh, life is great and I can get through this no problem, have a positive attitude, well, then that makes the people who are also going through chemo have, feel like, oh, gee, I'm not doing something right. And God, you know, pick on me, you know. So I decided that I had to find a nice middle. I didn't want to talk about the, uh, the, um, the nails being gone because I felt like maybe people wouldn't go get chemo because they thought that... Their nails will fall off, and that's really disgusting. But, you know, but I didn't, I, it was a really a hard battle. I had a lot of conversations with me. I'd post things, and then I'd, I'd have to, like, change it, and I'd say, no, I, I, I better word it differently. I have to find a way of getting the message across that's, that it's not as bad as I thought it was going to be, but it's not something I would volunteer to do just because I had nothing better to do. So I was trying to find a way of doing that, but... So I was very public, and we're taking, like I said, a lot of pictures. I don't plan on being bald again. So we did a lot of photos. So Nosferatu, I had never heard of Nosferatu. And one of, I was taking a lot of different kinds of photos, you'll see in a minute. And one of the Facebook friends of mine said, if you take a picture of you dressed as Nosferatu, I will give a $100 donation to the Cancer Society in my area. I was like, game on. So I didn't know what Nosferatu was. I looked it up on Wikipedia. And I found this vampire. So my boyfriend and I went and just did some crazy stuff. And I, and I took this picture. And I duplicated it. And apparently, it looks a lot like Nosferatu. And I've looked at the pictures. They're pretty good. i got fake ears on. i got fake teeth, like, 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 like pieces of uh, paper rolled up and stuck on my teeth. Uh, the nails are kind of fake and all that. But once you start photoshopping and playing around with it, it looks pretty good. So the guy I donated, uh, I put the picture up and he said, oh, that is so awesome, Susan. You went way beyond what I thought you were going to do. So um, he uh, donated $250. And the funny thing is he goes in to the donate, the, donate the money to the, to the cancer place. And he walks in and there's a little lady sitting there, you know, and they're, oh, hi, how can I help you, you know? And he says, well, I'm here to donate some money because of my friend on Facebook dressed up as Nosferatu with her cancer. And they're like, what are you talking about? It was totally, so he's showing him pictures, all these pictures I've done. So, oh, here I am, Uncle Fester from, uh, <laughs> that was really kind of interesting. And uh, here's another outfit that I had. And here I am as Medusa. I really had fun. You recognize the dress. That's the outfit that was on that last one. And here I was a phrenology dummy. I won a Halloween contest with this. And I just wore all black. And then people wrote, my, wrote stuff all over the outside of my head. There I am getting my head written on. Eyeliner works good. So anybody who might want to write on the head eyeliner. You got to get the kind of eyeliner that doesn't smear so easily. I had to try all kinds of things. We were like felt pens. I didn't want to do a felt pen because it would stick, you know, a Sharpie. So, uh, oh, here's a picture of the, uh, the, the, they call it AC. It's a, it's a, out of city, but I don't know, some of them something. So this is what it looks like. And it, it is, it wasn't as bad as I thought. I mean, they keep scaring you with some, well, you know, you might be doing this and this might happen. And I'd say, really, really? And they're like, well, everybody's different. But this is the chemo, the last chemo I got that's supposed to be the most powerful. But, you know, it was about the same as everything else. I don't, I, I but it was very toxic. So she had to be very careful when putting it in me. And, oh, here I am. Anybody recognize that? Who's that? 
There you go. Hi, Dr. Evil. That was hard. And you can see I'm missing all my eyelashes. My eyebrows are like great. I grade them out as much as possible, but I really don't have any eyelashes. That was a really hard picture to do. And I could not get my cat to sit right. I'm like, come on, let's sit on, sit on me here so I can have a cat and stroke it and everything. But that was my Dr. Evil pose. And that was that. So um, here, let's leave it on the Dr. Evil picture because that, that's kind of cool. So my, my advice to you is if you're going to be going through chemo or if you think you're going to be um, facing these challenges that I did, or if you have friends or family that might be doing this, really, here's what worked for me. As I worked all through my, all through my uh, treatment, and it was a long treatment, obviously. It takes about six months to go from the beginning to end. I think I was diagnosed in June. Um, I had my last treatment at Christmas time. And then um, I went through radiation until like March or something like that. But there's a blame culture out there. And I was really fascinated by this culture of I must have done something wrong. And people were, were trying to grilling me about what must I have done wrong. You didn't drink enough water, Susan. You're not eating, your vegetables are not, are, you're killed. You're, you need to be eating the skin of your vegetables. Oh, you need to, you need to exercise more. Oh, it's because you eat at McDonald's. You, you know, on and on and on with this blame culture. And what I would tell them is, you know, well, obviously it's not helpful. But I was trying to understand why people were trying to find the reason why I had cancer. Because I didn't have any of the bad habits, like I said, that's normally associated with getting some sorts of cancer. And what I finally realized is, is that they were trying to justify why I had it so that they could say, well, if only I don't do that behavior or my family, I won't get cancer. Because I used to carry my phone, and I still do too, and I don't know about you guys, you carry your phone like this in your bra. Lots of women do. And so people go, I mean, you know, hello. So it's like, so what? And it was, I always carried it on this side. And this is the one that got it. So I don't know if it radiated across or something like that. But so I got this kind of, a, you know, and I thought, well, okay, so if you think that you're getting radiation from your, you're getting the cancer from the phone being near, what is the problem when you have it on your head like this? And they're like, oh, well, I get it to you too. It's like, no, no, no. So I was able to kind of do a lot of educating people as I went along. And I would say, so how would that work? And why can't, why don't we know that? Well, you can find it on the internet. And it's like, well, yeah, okay, but are you really, is it evidence-based? Do we know that? And so they kind of, you know, we were able to have better conversations about things like that. But I did find, same thing with urban legends. People are more likely to feel like we're in a crazy world that you don't know what's gonna happen. A car could hit you, you could, a building can fall down, earthquakes, well, I live in the area where there's a lot of earthquakes. So people want to have some sort of control in their lives. And that's kind of what happened with urban legends. I don't know if you've heard these things where people say, don't go to the mall on Halloween because there's going to be a shooting. That's our urban legend. And so it, it, it's like it's not telling you where the shooting is going to be or how you know that, but they feel like they have some kind of control that they say, okay, um, I, I know that I have some control in my life now. I know that if I don't go to the mall on Halloween, I'm safe for that. It doesn't really make a lot of logical sense, but it's a way of feeling like you have some control. And I think that's why I was getting people trying to blame me. But the truth of the matter is, is my doctor said, we don't know why you got cancer, Susan. We have no idea why you got cancer. Sometimes things happen. It just happens. And it can happen to anybody. And my attitude did change a little bit. I, I, it was kind of a wake up call. I, I kind of stopped and said to myself, you know, I better stop putting off those things that I said I was gonna do someday and start doing them. Because you don't know if, you know, I stopped riding the motorcycle because I thought it was gonna be, it was dangerous. And I wanted to live a lot longer. I had a new boyfriend and so on. And, and you know, I found my last boyfriend, I hope. And I wanted to be safer. But really, you don't have that. It's, it's, it could be anything that's going to take us down. One thing we know for sure, we know 100% for sure, we're all going to die. And it's just how you deal with it to get there. 
that is really what's important because your children are watching you, your family members are watching you, and if you want them to get the best treatment possible, and if you want them to follow the doctor's advice, and you want them to stay healthy and, and live and give you grandchildren, and great grandchildren, or whatever, you need to model the behavior because they're watching you the whole time. So you need to be sure to, to not, how do I say it, to, to uh, do the best for yourself. If you want to be a bitch and, and, and have problems and mope and groan about it, that's fine. But I found being active, being around people who were fun, doing stuff, getting, up, getting off my ass and doing it and not letting somebody else do it for me, that helped so much. And when you do have a friend or family member that has cancer or any kind of illness, treat them just like anybody else. You know, take them out to the movies, you know, get your vaccines and stuff so you keep healthy so that they stay healthy. But really just, you know, don't be there for them, but do stuff with them. Go for a walk. Go out to play a pool. Invite them over for games. Don't treat them like they're, you know, like, you know, different. Because they're just still the same person. So I guess that's basically my, my lecture, and I'm sure you have some questions. Or how do you want to have it? Yeah, it's in America too. So the question is that in Australia, he's heard that they're changing the ages of people getting mammograms, the frequency of it. And that's true because what was happening is a lot of false positives happen. And if you don't have a history of, of getting cancer, it's, they, they think that there's a lot of stress involved. So if you, get, if you go in for your mammogram, not only is it expensive, uh, but you're going in, you're having your mammogram a lot of women have dense breasts where it's just denser. And so they have to bring them in for follow-up. It's very stressful for the person to have to go through that, that period. So they think that statistics, statistics, say the word statistically, they found that really uh, maybe every three years or something like that if you have no history. Once you hit 50, I think they want you to go every couple of years or something like that. But you know, you do your own examination and you just play the risk. You know, if you get it, Hopefully they catch it pretty quick. But stage one is just they remove the, the tumor. And if they remove the tumor, that's like 80 something percent chance of survival if they get it all, that's like done. The chemo and the radiation are just plus. Stage two is when it travels from here to your lymph nodes, stage two. So it goes under here so they have to take out some of your lymph nodes. Stage three is when it's starting to go over your body. Stage four is when it's really traveling through your body and going into different organs and things like that. So catching it with stage one, oh, that's like almost nothing compared to what I went through. Stage two is whenever you have to have the chemo. And three and four, and people do survive from three and four. It's just riskier, but people do. Any other questions? How did you pay for it? That's a great question. How do you pay for it? That's really expensive, because it's just me. Sell a cat. No, I'm only kidding. Um, what, what happened in California is that we didn't, I had insurance, but I didn't have, I was like, God, how am I going to pay for this? I called my mammography center after I found my first bill was $1,000. And for my first thing I had done, and I called my said, is there anything out there that you know of that I could probably look into? She said, well, there is this program. Um, here's a phone number for this people at the county, and they do this thing, and try calling them. So I called them up and made an appointment that same day. I had to prove I had breast cancer. The same thing goes for men with prostate cancer. You prove it with a, you know, from the, from the uh, hospital record. And then you have to show that you um, have insurance, I think is what she did. And I went down to have, and I had an interview with the woman. She filled out all the forms. And I said, you know, I still don't really know what I'm doing and what I'm signing up for. She goes, oh, no, no problem. I'll take care of it. I said, well, what is this? And it's Medi-Cal. Medi-Cal is California. It's like Medicaid in America. And what it was is a program that pays through medical bills for 18 months. 
So you get a Medi-Cal card. Even though I had insurance, even though I had a house, they still were, uh, they paid for everything. And I asked her, well, you didn't ask me my income. She goes, we don't care about your income. She says, no. So I left, I was in tears because um, she says, I've never heard of anybody being turned down for it. I walked out of there within 15 days, I had a Medi-Cal card. They paid for 100% of everything. And not only that, they paid for my vaccinations, they paid for anything that had to do with medical, straight across. So I was in, when I knew when my day was up, when my Medi-Cal was in, I was getting everything I could possibly get done, done. Because it was free, 100% free, every doctor's visit, everything. And I know myself, I would have cut costs. I know I would have not had all the radiation. I know I would have probably cut back on the chemo. I know I would have done it because I'm sure it would have been expensive and I would have said, that's all right, you know, you got most of it when you just took the tumor out. Uh, I'll just do um, half of that. And they would have, you know, because I know that's how I would have been. But because it was paid for, I went through the whole treatment. Who funds it? California, state of California. So it's public health? Yeah, it's public health. But it's, it's, a, it's a program that nobody even knew about her. So every time I talk publicly in America about you know, I talk about the cancer treatment. I make sure I tell everybody that there's these programs out there that are just a little known. I have a question. I sure. You sound like um, you mentioned about being in control, and I would imagine you're maybe a fairly inquisitive or questioning person. Did, uh, did you at any point, uh, I think it's different in America to how it is in the UK, but did you at any point think, I might just check all bit still down scientifically, but I might check if there's another doctor or is there a better hospital or am I getting the right? Or did you just sort of say, no, I'm going to accept my doctor? That's safe. exactly what I did. Because there's too many decisions, there's too much happening to you at once. And I, at least this is how they did it in America, is they just handed me like, this is it, you're done. And I thought, well, good, I felt relieved. Now I can go deal with the other stuff I'm going to have to deal with. I felt like that's off my plate. And everybody kept telling me, oh, these people are great. You know, you're the best surgeon. He did, he made a really, really beautiful scar. It's like barely you can see it all. Um, but yeah, I didn't check into anything because I felt like, what do I know? I mean, I, what am I going to do? Go look on like Google list and see, <laughs> read your doctor or something like that. But no, I didn't. I just went with the advice. I'll know I'm cancer free and you have to be five years cancer free before you can say you're cancer free. And I'm only two years down. So. Did you ever doubt the diagnosis? No, because as soon as they told me that it was there, I could feel the little bump. You could feel it, it's like a little, it was like a, a pea, a little smaller than a pea. You could almost just play with it right there. So I knew that was what it was. Well, that's the existence of a bump, but cancer's Right, so then when they take it out, then they have to look to make sure it's, it's, uh, it's spreading, that it is tumorous, it's, you know, it's cancerous. No, I didn't never, question never it all. I, I, you know, I'm a skeptic about a lot of things, but after a while, you just gotta, you just gotta take their word for it. They've got the degrees I don't, and why, why question something that's, that's obviously working? But, but they did a biopsy. Yeah, and they said it's cancerous. No, I had no other alternative treatments. The only alternative treatment that I could even say was just a positive thing that I tried to do, even though positive that doesn't really do anything for you having a positive attitude. What it does do, and they taught, this is what I did learn, and I, they, my doctors told me, and I assume this is right, is that when you have steroids, and they give you steroids when you're going through chemo, which puts on weight, um, it makes you feel better, it makes your, your treatment better. But you can make a steroid, your body can make a natural steroid by being active. So when you're out walking, your body's making a steroid that makes you feel better, so that makes you go do more walking, and it's, it's a cycle. So a person who comes in and sits down in front of the TV and, and just watches TV and doesn't do anything, and they mope, and, they, and they're like this all day long, they're not getting up and making the steroid, so they feel worse. So it's a, it's a, it's a, it's, so the more active you are, the better you feel, because you, you're active. I know it's, it is circular, but that would be the only thing I can consider that I tried that was not really alternate, but it was like, really? I didn't know that. That's cool. So I had to go mow the lawn. I had to fold clothes. I had to do the dishes. They told my son this too. Thank you. 
They said that, um, you know, don't treat her, don't baby her. You know, if the dishes need to be done, tell her to go do them. And he was fine with that. <laughs> He'd be like, I'd be like, Sterling, can you do that? No, Mom, doctor said you need to do it. <laughs> really? Come on, honey, I got cancer. He's, I don't care. Get up and do it yourself. And that's how he treated me, and it was actually better. Instead of pampering me, I actually had an easier treatment, it was, and I felt better, and I was able to get more things done because I had to say to myself, no sitting around. I did a lot more walking. I put in a lot more weight. I gained 15 pounds because the doctor said, eat anything you want. So I did, you know, ice cream, whatever I wanted. So I put on weight, I still haven't taken it off. But, you know. You know, when you were ill, I'm sure there were well intentioned people who suggested, you know, taking medicine, back and stuff that you know, didn't believe in. Um, any advice that you could give like people who will oh, in the future? How can we how to deal with that? You know. I was up front. I had um, I sent out an email blast to my all the my peers in my company because I don't know how they feel about this, but I did not want to have to deal with people come in and giving me suggestions of horse pills and stuff like that. I really didn't want to have to deal with that. I mean, you've got enough on your plate. You just don't want to have to deal with it. So what I did is I sent out an email blast to everybody and also on Facebook, and it was like, I have cancer, I announced it on, I'm on uh, Skepticality, it's a podcast. So on Skepticality, I just said, you know, blah, 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 blah. By the way, I have breast cancer, and I'm gonna be going through treatment pretty soon, and, and so on. And I just bluntly said it. And I did that too, like I said, in the email blast, and I said, and by the way, I have great doctors. I'm following the advice of my doctors, and I plan on sticking to the schedule of what I'm told to do. And when people would try to try to nudge that in there, I'd just be like, I'm going with the advice of my doctors. Thank you very much. I know you mean well, but I'm not going to be trying anything alternate because I really do believe this is what's going to work. And, it, and I'm fine. I mean, I have... I mean, I know it's anecdotal, but I, it really is. The doctors and everybody else, you're, you're, you, see, you meet other people all the time, and it's like, yeah, you go back to your normal life. Your hair grows back. I haven't cut my hair. This is, this is hair grad, uh, grown in from that. It's been a year and a half, but what was fascinating, and people might know, I had the straightest hair. This is called chemo curl, and people kept telling me that was going to happen. I thought, no, that's ridiculous, but I had this curly, wavy hair. And it's still there, so I haven't cut my hair because I don't want to cut it off. I've got this curls. And they just grew back, but the rest of it, you can see, is just straight as a board. But I don't know why that happens. I think that's fascinating. But I've got chemo curl. David? A couple times during your talk, you said you're a very colorful person. Very I am. Person. And a lot of people know who you are. So tell us why a lot of people know who you are. You just mentioned skepticality, but you have another project that you work on. Oh, yeah. So I'm. You know, and that was the thing is I can't hide. I couldn't put a wig on and pretend I wasn't going through cancer treatment. I mean, I, would be, I couldn't hide it, so I had to just go with it and just be as public as possible because I just didn't know how to handle it. But I have a lot of different projects. I'm known in the skeptic community for a lot of other projects. I, uh, my passion is psychics and, and dealing with psychics. So I've been um, doing a lot of things dealing with psychics. I have one podcast that I'm on. It's the oldest skeptic podcast, and it's one of the most popular. It's called Skepticality. I have a segment on there every every time they release a segment, which is like every two weeks. How much older is it than the others? It is a few weeks older than the SDO. A couple of weeks. It is, but it is the oldest. Thank you very much. It is the oldest, and we do have a ton of viewers, listeners. And I'm on a lot of other podcasts, just like, you know, do a little segment and when I can. I have a project called Gorilla Skepticism on Wikipedia, and this is the thing that I'm kind of known for because I have a group of about 100 people, more or less, editing Wikipedia in multiple languages, and we're trying to repair Wikipedia, and we're trying to get really good content out there where people can get great evidence, and they can go in and make up their own minds. So when there's an alternative treatment out there, and you're, you're, you don't know how to evaluate it, and you don't really want to go to the, like the Mayo Clinic or the, those scientific pages, and you don't want to go to the pages that are kind of like, it doesn't seem like it makes a lot of sense, there's no evidence. The middle ground is Wikipedia. And you can get some really great, um, you can read the first couple 
paragraphs, and you could, should be able to get enough information to kind of give you some idea of what they're talking about. And then you can go down to the bottom of the page, and you can read the citations, the citations are gonna show you uh, where to go to get better information. So we believe that you're gonna be able to educate people much better than yelling at them, telling them you're an idiot, you know, what's wrong with you, how stupid you are. But if you tell them, go do a little research and try checking out Wikipedia, they're gonna, they're gonna go home and they're gonna look, they're gonna Google it, whatever the term is, they're gonna get a Wikipedia page, we all know that, and they're gonna read that, and they're gonna probably go and look at the links if they're interested enough and get enough information to make an informed decision. And then when they come back to you the next day and they say, you know, I did some research, I think that, I think I'll stick with my doctor's treatment, what they mean is they probably went to the internet and they probably got a Wikipedia page and then they followed the citations and got more information. So the stuff that you do on Wikipedia and the editors that you use around the world, there's some people in the room who are who are editors with you. Um, you guys are focused on pages that might come up in skeptical conversations. So right. Famous skeptics, issues within skepticism. Yeah, scientific but, skepticism. But more than that, the whole method of editing and writing on Wikipedia is a skeptical process. Yes. Skeptic, uh, Wikipedia is the ultimate skeptical tool. That is a skeptical project. You have to have citations to prove what you're editing and adding to a page is actual. It's actually so If you're going to put up a date and time for an event, you've got to go do the research. You can't just go, hey, I was there, man, I saw it happen. Yeah, you have to have a citation to prove that that happened and, and so on. So, and you cannot express an opinion. I can't express an opinion unless I was to find somebody who is notable with the same opinion as mine and use their quote. Sure. Why is cancer? Like, why everyone seems to be so interested in cancer, you know? It's the same thing that when we talk about the cosmology, you know, everyone seems to be so much, I mean, like, they seem to be so much interested in this part of science, but not other part of science. Well, I guess because it affects so many people. I mean, um, if you were, if, if it was in your family or it's happened to you, that's on your mind. And I think that because cancer is something that we are winning the battle on, um, and I think that there's, that, you know, it's, if, if it's heart disease, I think that gets a lot of attention to diabetes and stuff like that. But so it just seems like it. I so there's a couple of reasons why cancer really gets medical attention uh, or attention. But just to like, like lots of yeah, well, topics. The, yeah. the reason they get attention, one, is because for a very long time, we had had cancer to die. Yes. It was fatal for a long time, and we made huge progress. It's very frustrating to go out and do research on something like ALS, which people die from. We haven't made progress on it in 30 years, yet you know, people are still dying from it. We know we can make progress on kids. We're gaining an understanding of the world, winning the battle. So it's something we can Yeah, it's kind of almost the low hanging fruit almost. You know, we, we're, we're getting so close to it, and I say we. Um, it feels like they're, they're making such inroads that it's something that we might be able to cross off the list. I mean, it's also extraordinarily I mean, I've had two members of my family with cancer, and, and they're completely different, and they would be they're treated in different ways. Um, so I think once you start opening up the cancer box, it's like a Pandora's box. It can be there's all kinds, and I didn't realize that either. I had yeah. no idea. And there's lots of kinds of treatments, lots of kinds of different things. You know, people react differently. Some people don't even lose their hair when they get chemo. Yeah. Believe it or not. So one last question for you. Yes, sir. If someone here tonight wanted to participate in Real Skepticism on Wikipedia project, they want to get involved, right. they have a special interest in some area of skepticism, they wanted to edit a Wikipedia page, what is it that Real Skepticism on Wikipedia provides for them? Well, I do all the training. We have a forum where we do our training. So if anybody's interested, and I brought business cards somewhere, I don't know where I put them now. We'll put a link up on 
Okay, yeah. Oh, I have I have cards. I have them with me. Ah, make sure you get a card for me. Um, you can see all kinds of stuff right there from uh, on my website. There's tons of stuff on here. I also have a Wikipedia page, by the way. Um, that's another story. But what we ask people to do is not to join the GSOW. We call it the GSOW because girl skepticism on Wikipedia is quite long. We ask people not to join at the moment. We ask people to go online, do a little research, um, read about what we've done, what we do, listen to the interviews of the people who edit for me, and get an understanding because the training process to be an editor, I handle the training, um, is month or more. And then once you're trained, you're put in a community of editors and you're on a team and you get to interact with them and you get to change the world. It's really exciting the things that you're going to be doing. People are going to read stuff that you have done. Millions of people are going to read what you've written. Millions of people people's minds will probably be changed by something you've written. It's extremely powerful. This is the way to educate. I truly believe it. Because not only are you individual readers reading Wikipedia, but the media is picking up the Wikipedia. The military, the medical community, they're getting their information from Wikipedia. It's kind of scary, but that's what's happening. So we ask people, once they've done some research they, and they get an understanding of what the training's like, write to me, write to us. There's a whole bunch of us. And then we'll start to train. And then together we will rule the world. <laughs> 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 Thank you.